Good afternoon. I'm calling the House Education Finance Committee to order. Um, we don't yet have a quorum, but Representative Backer, I see you've got your testifiers and ready. So I think what we'll do is have you go ahead and present your bill, and then I'm going to announce that by the time you get through with the presentations and your testimony, your testifiers will have enough people here to probably put your bill before us. So. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and members. Um, this just uh, is a bill that's very local. It's a local bill that focuses on uh, Browns Valley. And yeah, just to give you a very brief history, the school district, which I've been a pleasure observing at school board before I was elected as House of Representative, has been around since 1981 and been servicing South Dakota and Minnesota school students since that time. And pretty much up to 2009, everything looked quite well. Uh, with some changes between the agreement between the state of Minnesota and South Dakota in 2009, our uh, four year old students did not receive income funding after that. Our testifiers will go through that. So, with that said, I will turn it over to our testifiers. Um, and thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Packer. Um, I agree to the testifiers. If you would please just state your full name for the record and uh, before you proceed, and then we look forward to your, to your comments. Thank you. Hi, I'm Brenda Reed, Superintendent of Browns Valley Schools. Uh, thank you. And I'm going to just uh, follow up with Mr. Racker. Um, the school was established in uh, 1881, and then this started a unique relationship between the state of South Dakota and Browns Valley. West Browns Valley, Minnesota, is located in South Dakota. So that's very unique. Now today, these uh, residents' families have a South Dakota license with a Minnesota physical address on their license. And until 1994, Browns Valley School District was governed by two districts. Browns Valley, Minnesota, 801, and South Dakota School District, 54-1. And the South Dakota District was fiscally responsible for education expenses and also maintenance. They also paid their fair share for a new elementary building and a high school building. Later on, this district was dissolved and we uh, started a collision agreement with Sisson, South Dakota, which is only 12 miles away. And at this time with the agreement, four-year-olds were able to be serviced in our school district for special education and also a preschool program. We experienced no problems. And it was from 1994 to 2009. Then in 2009, the South Dakota Minnesota Reciprocity Agreement was passed. And unfortunately, it was really not in our favor for our four year olds. The agreement was only for K through 12. Currently, our four year olds in our preschool program cannot receive special ed services. And now, uh, as of today, 49% of our student population. Are there are students from South Dakota. And uh, the Facebook program is a feeder program, and uh, we need to address the problem of our four year old South Dakota students not receiving special ed services. And we need to tell their kindergarten what they do from their school. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Madam Chair members. Um, my name is Janice McCarthy. I'm the principal and district assessment coordinator at the Browns Valley School. And I'm just going to touch briefly on our academic performance. Uh, for the last two years, we have been named a reward school by the Minnesota Department of Education. Um, this just means that we ranked among the top 15% of the highest ranking students in the state. Um, this shouldn't be possible with us the students that we have. Demographically, we are at 72% grade reduced. 59% of our students are Native American. Um, because of the strong um, that they receive in the pre kindergarten program, we're able to produce high quality students from the state of Minnesota. Basically, what we're asking for is that same opportunity for our families that live on the west side of Lake Travers, families that live in South Dakota but have a physical Minnesota address, families that are a part of our community, 
families whose parents, grandparents have, have gone to our school and choose to send their children here because it is their home. So we're asking for your support in the mail. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. My name is Mark Goodhart, and I've been the pre kindergarten teacher for the Rollins Valley School District since 1998. For the past 17 years, I have observed four year olds in the entire district low on language and communication, developmentally delayed, and even not verbal. All Rollins Valley pre kindergarten students with IEPs were serviced by Minnesota until the reciprocity agreement in 2009. We are no longer able to provide those services until the students enter into kindergarten. The first five years of a child's life are the most important in development, and yet we are asking children with delayed developments to wait another year, allowing that child to fall even further behind. I am the first person to team up with our families and our children in our community, in our district, both first through registration and then through the summer visit. My goal with the summer visit is to begin to build that relationship with each family and their child. As I interact with the children, I began to observe developmental and speech language concerns. The whole time I'm thinking to myself, the only choice that I have to offer the West Browns Valley families are to wait another year until they can begin services when their child enters kindergarten. Browns Valley is their community. It's the community in which they live. It's the community where they buy their groceries and their gas. It's the school that's a mile and a half from their home. At this time, I truly feel like I'm failing the families and their children. There's nothing worse than a child in need of services and we are unable to provide them. Our families are confused at this and not understanding why we are unable to help. It just doesn't seem educationally ethical to me. The pre-kindergarten program in Browns Valley was started through a federal first grade preparedness grant where we served as a pilot school for three years. We also had a Head Start program in our community that eventually collaborated with the school district. We no longer have the support of either of these programs. We have lost our funding, staff, and additional resources for our families. We are one of the poorest counties in Minnesota, and yet our Head Start program was cut from our county. We stand alone as a district. A major change took place 10 years ago in our district when a colleague and myself decided to invest our time to learn sign language and implement sign language into our daily schedule. We now do sign language throughout our daily routine. We see sign language as a best practice in our district. Sign language not only provides our students with success in communication, but being able to participate as well. Our students enter the, our district in the fall with data demonstrating that we are 15 to 20 percent below the state average. In the spring, our data demonstrates that we are ending above the state average. Our data for our Native American students demonstrate that, demonstrates that zero percent are on target for kindergarten when they enter in the fall. And in the spring, our data demonstrates that 60 to 100 percent of them are on target for kindergarten. So we know what we're doing in our district is working. When our first class of pre kindergarten entered into third grade, I remember as if it were yesterday. The third grade teacher came into my classroom to celebrate the fact that all of her students were readers. For the first time, our district did not have a non-reader in third grade. That still stands true today. I can name the non-verbal children that have come into our district. And as I follow them through the grades and watch as they progress, I see that some of them are at grade level. Some of them are slightly below grade level. And many of them are significantly below grade level. And I have to wonder, where would those students be if they wouldn't have lost a year of special services. Last Friday, I had the opportunity to observe Josephine, a past student of mine. She was in the hockey having a conversation with our custodian. And as I walked by, I noticed a smile on her face. She was enjoying that interaction. The cool part to this story is three years ago, when she entered into the pre-kindergarten program, she was nonverbal. 
so nonverbal that she was unable to state her name. And that's when the first modification took place. She is still known today as many of our staff and students as Jojo. Our families are choosing our district as their school family. Our school is in their community, but yet we cannot meet their needs. We are not only setting the foundation for their education, but for their life. Let's not fail them. Let's not turn our families away. In closing, we have a, a one-minute video that's going to demonstrate some of what you have heard today. inviting the commissioner to please come for a visit. Their greed is in Pitta Washte, Dakota, for a day. Today is Wednesday. Holly is the star of the day. Please come for a visit. Sign on the little T words. I'm asking you to please support House File 1259. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and uh, Representative Becker, we have quorum, so I'm going to formally move your bill that uh, House Bill 1259 be re referred to the Committee on Ways and Means. But it was my intention to lay it over today for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. Uh, and thank you all for your testimony. Uh, Representative Detmer, um, I had you now just having a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. May I just remind you, this is an isolated case with South Dakota. Uh, we haven't seen the cases with uh, North Dakota, Iowa, Wisconsin, or the other border states. Yeah. Thank you for bringing this bill forward. Uh, and I'm uh, aware of that science. When we did the bill there, uh, Representative, uh, we were very narrow focused with the Minnesota residents that live in South Dakota, because this is West Bounds Island, like our superintendent has shared. Um, they have Minnesota driver's license, so uh, it is very limited, and we did not find uh, other scenarios through the border with um, South Dakota, Iowa, Wisconsin, unless we overlooked something, but we did not find any representatives. Representative Denver. That answers my question. Thank you. Uh, Representative Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just thought it was an excellent job out there. And uh, thank you for coming today and sharing uh, what you're doing. And to represent a backer, um, this bill this needs to get done. And uh, thank you for bringing it. And I uh, support your bill today and making it this morning. So thank you. Thank you, Representative. And I'm just one quick thing to add uh, share with the members. One of the key things um, with our school district is. As, as we heard from testifiers, they start um, non-verbals, and our demographic shows that we should not be a reward school. And our staff and teachers um, work really hard. Now, on a side note, Brenda, Miss Reed, was my special ed education student when she came. How many years ago, Brenda? No. No, go <laughs> She just turned 18, so. Okay, actually, my birthday's Friday, so. Thank you, Madam Chair. Let me, I hope you won't indulge a question not directly on it. It was triggered. I, I really wonder, um, you mentioned Sisseton um, as being real close. Um, when my mom taught there, she taught with a Minnesota license, no South Dakota license. Is that still true? Uh, who wants to take that one? As far as the, the, 
we have to meet the Southern Licensing Team. All teachers do. And do you have to? Oh, yeah, I actually have on South Dakota, but my driver's license is found all in Minnesota. Yeah, my driver's license. Yeah, but you're she has been. You have a Minnesota teacher's license. I have a Minnesota teaching license. That's what you're asking. Yeah, I have a Minnesota teaching license. I'm sure. I'm just not sure how they have, or like us, that you have to have a teacher's license in Minnesota. Is South Dakota oh. still recognized Minnesota teacher's license without a South Dakota one? We would need a South Dakota license to teach in South Dakota. Other questions? That moves to bear some people in your chair. And to the testifiers, did this problem arise because you lost or because the federal grant expired? Or have you had this as an ongoing program or our need? And have you been before us before? And I may have missed that because I came in late. Ms. Reed? The problem occurred with the special education of the four year old in 2009 when the reciprocity agreement started in 2009. Prior to that, there was a problem. And then, Madam Chair, that was our school district has never came in front of this committee or just that. So, I, I still trying to understand how all of this transpired. So, uh, Representative Backer or, or Ms. Reed or even Mr. Strong, it, was it just kind of informal agreements between South Dakota and Minnesota that allowed this to, to go forward for the number of years and then when something formal was done, the first things fell through the cracks? Madam Chairman and Representatives, the first uh, formal agreement between this well, it was first, I'll take it back, it was uh, uh, South Dakota was District 4, and then it changed to District 103, and then to District 54 and 1. And what happened in 1961, when the, the country schools were starting to close in South Dakota, Charles Valley was in the school committee, it was actually in the West Charles Valley, and so in 1961 was the first formal agreement with uh, South Dakota District and in our school district. And from then on, it just kept going, and now uh, we've had a tuition agreement. And they paid for the number of kids that came over to Minnesota, and we paid for our high school. Because we are pre K through grade 8. Okay. Now, Mr. Strong, do you know this sounds fairly unusual? <laughs> issues are worth highlighting here. As the superintendent says, prior to the statewide tuition reciprocity agreement, individual districts along the border could enter into an agreement, a tuition agreement with a neighboring district. And I'm not, uh, the superintendent has spoken to the specifics of theirs, uh, but essentially what happened is when the state, when the, two, the state was given authority to enter into a, 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 a uniform tuition agreement with South Dakota districts and the commissioner of education negotiated that agreement, and that agreement calls for uh, uh, coverage of activities uh, from kindergarten through enrollment from kindergarten on, and so it doesn't cover the, the pre-kindergarten activities. Um, in terms of the funding, the way the funding works under tuition reciprocity is South Dakota pays the South Dakota rate for their students, Minnesota pays the Minnesota rate for theirs, and then there's a settling at the end of the year. Um, and, and so it's a, it's a single uniform settlement. There are a number of districts along the South Dakota border for whom the tuition agreements work very well. There are a few districts for whom the uniform tuition agreement does not work well. Uh, Browns Valley is one example. There are a couple others I think you'll hear from another district later, uh, uh, later this week. Um, the issue, there, there are other issues related to early education that perhaps the, the Browns Valley uh, uh, folks can, can talk about the issues related to uh, who in South Dakota is responsible for those services. But as, uh, as of right now, without this legislation, the Uniform Tuition Agreement covers, and that, that covers only beginning in kindergarten. Thank you. That's um, 
helpful because it's, it's not abundantly clear right off the bat why this, why this occurred. So, um, other questions? All right, is there anyone else from the general public who would wish to testify on this bill? Seeing none, uh, Representative Backer, do you want to make any final comments? Well, Madam Chair, Representatives, I would ask for your support. As you can see, we are a small school district with limited resources, and we're producing students from a, 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 with special needs, and they're excelling. And that's really what we want to do here um, in this committee and as elected officials is put the best students forward, and, and Brown Valley is doing that. Thank you for your support and thank you for your time. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you to uh, your testifiers for being here today. And uh, with that, I will renew my motion that House Bill 1259 be referred to the Committee on Ways and Means, but I am laying it over today for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. Thank you very much. Is we have school readiness, we have early childhood family education dollars. 
which are designed to do exactly what we're trying to do with the scholarships, except in a limited fashion. And what the idea is, if we can give the flexibility of our schools, and I'm thinking primarily the rural schools, I'd love to hear from the, the metro legislators as well, but to give that flexibility out in, in the schools that they can move the early childhood dollars between those two accounts, between the school readiness and the family education, and craft their own school-based programs that fit the needs of their students. And the only way that I believe that also works is if we tie that to the forming funding, forming formula funding. So the idea is to, to give increase, to allow that to be tied to the formula, to allow pathway one dollars to flow purely through the pathway one formula, and allow schools then to operate uh, with their early childhood and school readiness to craft their programs. I believe that offers a lot of the flexibility we're looking for. That also gives us some of the uh, programs choices that we don't have in the rural areas. And of course this would also be predicated on the fact that we have to make sure we handle the CCAP and the Head Start funding as well. So those are the ideas behind the scholarship program. Uh, the policy you'll see in, in front of you here also, uh, uh, we begin to move towards removing the cap into a sliding uh, scale. I would personally like to get rid of the cap altogether because I think that is causing problems, but I do realize there are political realities to that. Um, but in here, we do allow that the commissioner may increase up to 15% the scholarship amount for children who are enrolled in the three and the four uh, parent aware programs. So, with that, I think that covers most of what we are trying to accomplish. And again, the language of that amendment I don't have in front of you here because I, I really wanted to get the committee, committee's opinion on that. I wanted to see if there was some value in allowing our schools to have some more flexibility and moving those dollars between ECFB and and school readiness, tying that to the funding formula, and then perhaps adding that later as, as we move this bill forward. And with that, I'll stand for, I'll have to stand for as far as questions. All right, any questions right now for Representative Preacher? Or perhaps we should go to testifiers, and I'm sure we'll come back to questions. So um, if there's those uh, people who wish to testify on House File 1220, if you want to move to the testifier table. Um, Chair, while they're coming up, uh, I'd like to ask Representative Fisher if you have any idea of, of the cost of what this might cost. And uh, the scholarship or the capital of the scholarship bill that I'm finding or the ECFB is for writing this portion. Chair, uh, Representative Fisher, you already wrote the scholarship. Representative Fisher. There's been a number of there's been a number of costs that have been thrown out there. Uh, I believe we have 23 and 23 in the base right now. Um, you can correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Strong or Ms. Johnson. But the total number has been anywhere from 250 to 300. Um, I think if we can get into the 100 million range, that's a great place to go. Um, ideally, I'd love to win the lottery in this and do it all at the 300. But I'm trying to work with reality. So I think we have at least a range of at least 75 to 300 million, somewhere in there, wherever I can. But I do have a bill coming up after this, but we're almost on the other side of this. We don't get all the funding here. Thank you. So, do you want to go ahead? Do you have specific testifiers, or I'll just call on them to introduce themselves? All right, very good. Well, welcome. We appreciate you coming to the committee today. If you please just state your name for the record and then please provide your testimony. Madam Chair. I'm uh, Frank Forsberg, and I work with Greater Twin Cities United Way as the Senior Vice President, and I also uh, have the privilege of serving as the Chair uh, for the Statewide Mini Minds Coalition. And I uh, think you distributed the list of the members uh, around, and uh, just wanted to recognize that this Statewide Coalition has more than 100 members today. It's a very diverse coalition, um, and I think it's a great uh, testament to the interest from across the state for early childhood education and in particular for the role that scholarships can play in helping to close that kindergarten readiness gap. Um, I have four few points that I'd like to make about the bill. Uh, first of all, uh, it does uh, offer to uh, uh, lift the cap that is currently in place and we want to support the lifting of the cap uh, in any way that uh, that can happen. 
Uh, we're very pleased with what we're learning from the four races of top transformation zones uh, in the state of Minnesota, and those have very flexible caps, very easy for those communities to work with, and it allows those communities to serve and meet the needs uh, of each unique individual child. So lifting the cap, I think, has a great track record, and I think we already have four good pilots that we can learn from. Uh, second, uh, tiered reimbursement. Just a little modification on what's in the bill. We like tiered reimbursement as a way to encourage uh, providers to become parent care rated and to reward those who are three and four star who are the highest quality with a higher level of reimbursement. We think that's how uh, we can change the system at scale. And uh, using that tiered reimbursement sends, I think, a terrific and powerful message uh, to the entire provider community. So we support that kind of uh, uh, reimbursement approach. Uh, number three, pathway two was uh, mentioned in the opening remarks, and it's been uh, struck from this bill. Uh, we want to you know, make sure we share with you that we have worked collaboratively over the last two years with schools, Head Starts, Department of Education, to really work on making pathway two effective. Uh, we want scholarships to work well for schools and for Head Starts. Uh, in working on that and making continued improvements in future years, we think would be the best option uh, so that schools and that starts across the state can smartly plan for and provide the services they're well qualified uh, to provide using scholarships effectively. And then finally, uh, at the end of the bill, cost. Uh, we know this is a tough issue, and the representative just talked about that. Many months when it built its initial business model with the help of the Federal Reserve two and a half years ago, identified that there are about 20,000 low income children in the state of Minnesota, three, four, and five year olds who are on a wait list of some kind or are underserved. Um, our estimate is that that would cost about $300 million for the biennium. On average, about $7 million or $7,000, excuse me, per scholarship. And so we just wanted to make sure we shared with you kind of what is the scope of the need as we understand it and what would be required to close that gap. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Forsberg. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Barbara Milan. I am the Executive Director for the Swinney Community Center. Very pleased to be here this afternoon at the Swinney Community Center. We have the oldest continuously operating child development center, the IT Welcome, in the state of Minnesota. Phyllis Whitley is now in its 90th year. We want to urge you to support early child development. We know from our uh, children who are in our program, children who have graduated, adults, children who became adults who are gainfully employed, that when we invest in our children, we are doing the right thing for children, for families, for our community, and for the state of Minnesota. Recently, we have had families to come in who were participants in our program. So we know that there is an intergenerational effect when we invest in our children. I, we are part of the Sweden Community Center, is part of the MAC Commonwealth Network of Early Child providers, and two of those organizations, and another colleague, between the three of us, we have 252 years of serving the community. And each of those organizations, the Family Partnership and Wage Grow, um, are rated four-star. And uh, so we want you to know that it's very important that we support our children now so that we have a future in tomorrow. Or tomorrow. So thank you for your consideration. We appreciate your support. We just want to think based upon the research, we have the Perry Scope research, we have the wonderful research by our Wellnick and also of Grunwald from our own Federal Reserve Bank of, of Minneapolis. That affirms that when we invest in our children longer term, we are contributing when they become adults, they are gainfully employed, they graduate from school, uh, we reduce rates of crime, and we have active and all citizens in our community. So we want you to support our child development scholarships. Thank you for your time. Thank you. 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 Thank
very much. Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Lynn Parker. I'm a family child care provider from Alexandria. Um, for the last 17 years, I've provided early education from 7 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. Monday through Friday in my living room, in my backyard, around my kitchen table. Um, it happens through play, and it happens where I, I meet each individual child's needs where they're at. Um, parents choose me to spend countless hours with them, with their children working on the, the skills that they need to succeed. Um, the, children, the parents choose me because they want a provider that is always there. They want their siblings to play and learn in the same room. They want, they value my approach for caring for their children. They value the traditions that I bring to their children. I'm proud to have earned a four-star group um, parents who are waiting. Um, and I continue to support and encourage other uh, fellow providers through mentorship and training to participate in parent to wear. And as an early childhood provider and a small business owner, my family child care program is very important in it to me and to the community. Um, I'm a critical part of the group of individuals and organizations um, that are responsible for helping prepare our children for school and for life and success. Um, I enable the parents to go to work each day without worry um, so they can earn a living and support their growing children. Um, I'm here today to ask you to support the increased investment in the early learning scholarships. Minnesota needs an all-hands-on-deck approach to achieve the school readiness goals. Um, and family and child care providers are ready and eager to participate in, in the success of our children. Um, scholarships offer one very important pre-K funding stream and honors the role that home-based family and child providers play in our local communities. Um, I urge the committee to support the importance of the Minnesota early education system. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and committee members. I'm Nancy Jost, and I work for West Central Initiative out of Fergus Falls. It's a community foundation. I have been in early childhood for 42 years, so I have worked in um, most of the early childhood um, settings that scholarships um, go to. Today, I wanted just to bring um, the parents' voice because we've heard from um, providers and many minds, and I thought um, we should also hear from um, families and parents. The first story I wanted to read to you is about um, a mom, and she writes, The early learning scholarship has been very helpful to me. A year ago, I was caught up in a cycle of abuse that was becoming harder and harder to break away from. I knew securing a job was the only way I could leave my abuser and become a financially independent single mom. Although my boys are in school, I needed child care for my youngest daughter to be able to commit to a job. Affordable child care was the way to make this happen. Finding a child care program with a good learning environment for my daughter was very important to me. Because we received a state scholarship, my daughter was able to attend Head Start. Her program has been everything I could have hoped for and more. Her teacher is like her second mom, who gives her the support, quality care, and education she deserves while I work to support our family, for which I am so grateful. I wouldn't have been able to achieve what I have in the past year without the scholarship that has started. With access to early learning scholarships, child care for my daughter has given me the opportunity to move forward in my life while knowing she is safe and being ready for kindergarten. Now that I'm working, I'm on the road to ending the cycle of abuse. No longer is this something my children have to live with and witness. Getting the negative influences out of my life this past year has been a work in progress, but it gets better every day. I can now be an example for my kids and show them that we can have a better life. I'd also just like to um, read some comments that were made from parents on the White Earth um, Reservation. Um, one mom says, I recently graduated from the White Earth Tribal and Community College in May of 2014. 
with an early childhood education degree, and I know that wouldn't have been possible without the scholarship. Because of the wider scholarship program, and this is another mom, I have been able to adopt two children, siblings, who have both been exposed to drugs and alcohol. I've worked full-time, and both children have scholarships to pay for their child care. One of the reasons that I decided to um, bring the parent perspective is because sometimes I think we think of scholarships as only benefiting the children, but it really is um, benefiting the whole family. And when we benefit the whole family, we benefit our communities and our state. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Joseph. My name is Jim from the Elementary from the Minnesota Business Partnership, and we'd like to thank Representative Preja for authoring this bill. And uh, I'd like to briefly highlight a couple reasons why we support House File 1220. First, as Representative Preja mentioned, it clarifies that we're in where scholarships are affordable. In other words, families will continue to have access to their scholarship funds when, either by choice or circumstance, they transfer their child from one eligible provider to another. Currently, this option isn't always available on the path I do. Second, we think 2020 has a more reasonable time period than 2016, which is current law, for requiring all parent aware providers to either be a free or four star program. One new issue we'd like to put out there for consideration as this as rolls well along is allowing families to use their scholarship in more than one provider. For example, they may use a school based program in the morning and another parent aware provider in the afternoon. Under current law, this flexibility isn't allowed. And finally, um, we'd ask that as you put together your budget uh, that you include additional funding to help expand the number of low income families that have access to effective early ed services through parent aware scholarships. And just as a last point, we'd like to emphasize that the scholarships can be used with a wide variety of providers, whether they're school-based, Head Start, center-based, or family-based providers. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm Sam Murphy. Last year, Mr. Bob Allen. Manager. Manager, Mr. Bob Allen. If we divide up the scholarships, we, we be hurting some of the providers by you, you use the example of uh, one provider in the morning and a different provider in the afternoon. And so if you didn't offer both variety and both services then would you be would you use provider be hurt? Mr. Bartholomew, my name is Chair Representative Murphy. As, as we understand it, if, if a family of parents is doing that arrangement currently, they use one in the morning, one in the afternoon, they will only be able to use a portion of their scholarship uh, during the morning or after the morning provider. Uh, they would be able to access, so they theoretically wouldn't be using all the available scholarship funds that they had. So we're kind of leaving on the table for the family additional scholarship funds that they could otherwise use if they had. Which may be so long as it can be. But I understand you would not be for changing the morning provider, but also provide funding for the afternoon provider. It's just making better use of the, the funds that are available. Representative Murphy. And the chair, the previous test buyer um, was, no, it's Barton, I think it was. Um, the, the test by that, he said you, you're there in the morning, you're there in the afternoon. If the child didn't come in the afternoon, then would you would you lose that income then 
from the scholarship from the student in the morning. Ms. Barton, um, Representative Murphy, that is um, a difficult question to answer um, due to the grounds that every child care provider sets up their funding a little bit differently. Um, some providers charge hourly, some charge half day, some charge full day, some charge weekly. Um, so it really depends on the provider. Um, my experience and, and conversation shows that a lot of times in this kind of scenario, that a lot of that funding goes unused because it's used in one source and then it can't pass that money doesn't carry over to the next provider, whether it's a school or a sector or a family child or father. Okay. Now, Ms. Chan, then just one more question, Ms. Barton, that um, tell me again the time that you, you're there to serve the students that come to you. Uh, I, my hours are 7 in the morning to 5.30 in the evening. That's what I thought you said. Um, and then, Chad, there's a red ball in your hand. Do you think that this, if you, if we were able to split the scholarship, then we would be able to provide um, a fairness for all the providers? Representative Murphy, I think so. That would be the intent while also providing the added flexibility for the parents. Representative Murphy, what do you think about defining the scholarship? Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Murphy, actually, that was an amendment that I had drafted that we didn't get. Um, I actually think it's a really good idea, and, and here's the reason. Uh, the focus of this program is on the families and directing the dollars to those families to choose for those children. Uh, while the, the providers do an absolutely wonderful job, from what I've heard, many of them are full. Uh, I believe you're full. And so uh, I understand the consideration of wanting to look out for them and their revenue and how well they do, but I think that program will be taken care of by the sheer volume and demand for these programs and these dollars flowing in. So I actually support breaking up the scholarships and allowing the flexibility. Um, in a lot of ways, I guess the, the simplest analogy is uh, that we treat this as cash, that they're providing, uh, they're, they're using this as a way to choose their education and their preschool programs, and if they can break it up because they have to, because of work schedules and things that happen, it's a great way for them to manage the, uh, the supplementary education of their children in preschool, if that makes any sense. So I, I really try to do the flexibility for the, the, my idea is flexibility, portability to these families. Let them uh, direct those funds in a way that helps them ma maximize their life and how they can educate their, their preschool children. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, so I have Representative Markport Newton on the list, but I think we have additional testifiers. Do you want to ask questions now? Or? Okay, all right, so I think. We'll go with, with, with two of you, and then if there's additional people that we should testify, uh, come on down. Uh, Representative, and Representative Mallory, I have you on the list. Uh, Representative Mudford. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I guess this is for also Mr. Bart, probably, is, and, and Representative Fisher, some condition for that part that delays until 2020, that uh, you have to go through the four star room quality. Okay. I mean, you know, this started probably about 2012, so it's going to be eight years down the line before we're requiring three to four star. And, you know, one of the strengths of this program is the quality and the fact that it's a parent aware system. And what, what is kind of perplexing for me is here, we're not going to say you don't have to be a three or four star. But in fact, if you went to a head start or school based, you know that's three or four start. So, Mr. Bartholomew and their representation, aren't we really messing in the quality of this program by saying we're going to go another four years and not require PG in four years? I mean, I don't know what the flexibility is. I think the market should drive the system here. And if daycare providers know that, I mean, this program started probably about 2012. That's even you know, eight years. I just think that's a real hit on the quality, and I just would like to maybe know the rationale for that and for this problem. Is this reducing quality of the program and the scholarships? 
representation? Do you want to take that first? Sure. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Representative Markford. I share those same frustrations. In fact, uh, I think the last, my, my hesitation on this is absolutely we want the quality right away. We want it tomorrow. Um, we want to make sure that that's there. But the reality for uh, 30 some counties is they, they just haven't been able to get there yet. As much as we've tried, where there's lack of funding, lack of education, lack of accessibility to these uh, programs, we haven't got it in a way that I believe this is a ubiquitous throughout the entire state. So that's why this is my capitalized language. To try to help those 30 some counties, we haven't quite got there yet. We have 50 some that I believe are there, and I, I, I can get to the exact counties. But uh, I want to try to help them be part of this program as well. And quite frankly, a lot of those are the rural areas that I, might, that I represent. Um, my county, New Jersey County, has come on uh, just lately, and they've been moving right along. Uh, Taft County has struggled a little bit to get in. So that's what I'm trying to do. Is a perfect solution? No. Is it the quality that I absolutely would love to see? No. But is it a way to keep us moving in the right direction that I think has momentum? Yes. So that's what I would offer up. And I, I believe uh, Erica Moss, if she's here, she also has some information on this as well. But I can kind of tell you more, but I can't take the hard line approach to say if we just make a hard line because we're we leaving it. I'm not trying to leave out anybody. And please move back to home here, Ms. Moss, if you want to help me out with this. Sure. Hi, could you state your name for the record? Madam Chair, members of the committee, Erica Moss from Parador School Writing as a nonprofit, independent nonprofit supporting the expansion of the Paranor ratings. Um, so to piggyback on what Representative Krisha said, there are actually about 40 counties in the state of Minnesota where ratings have only become available for the very first time, January 1st of 2015. Um, so, well, as Representative Mark Markler points out, the rating, the statewide expansion, the rating started in 2012. It was a stage rollout where some counties started in 12, some in 13, some in 14, and then finally statewide in 2015. So there are many counties in the state um, where child care providers have, are only now having their very first opportunity to enter the rating system. And um, the, what we see over time in areas where ratings have been, for example, since 2012, is increasing numbers of providers coming into the system and increasing numbers of providers moving up to four stars. We just um, actually haven't released this data publicly yet, but we do. One of the things that our organization does is, is um, over from 2012 to 2015, we're investing about a million dollars in evaluation of parent aware. And what we've seen with the most recent evaluation findings is that providers that came in maybe in 2012 um, at a one or a two star level, um, that many of them uh, get re rated at a higher level, at a three or four star level. So we do feel great about the fact that providers are increasingly adopting the rating system, um, that, they're, that they're taking advantage of what the system offers to improve their quality. Um, but it does take time, um, and in particular, the expectation that providers in these 40 counties where ratings have only been available for, you know, three months, um, it's, it's unrealistic to expect that they will come in and, and move up that quickly. There's um, even just awareness of the opportunity and availability of the opportunity, plus having to go through the rating process and participate in the program does take time. I think the solution is to keep the pathway to until you get all of these counties capable of having the three, four star. I, I don't think we should be compromising quality at this point just because we're not ready in a certain pathway. One, then let's keep the pathway to open until 2020 uh, when then you have everyone four star. I mean, I, I just. I don't think you should throw out one idea just to sit here because I think it is going to impact the quality until a certain point. Where was that, Krisha? And then, if you're good, I hope there are more good actually if you're going to do more. And I, I realize that's a compromise mm -hmm. position we may have to get to. Um, and as I said earlier, I just want to really looking for the feedback of the committee and, and you're helping with that. Um, perhaps there's a, a place in this where we do a grandfather uh, section or we do something to help mitigate that. And again, I'm also trying to with the early childhood and the school readiness, but what, what we don't want to do is leave kids behind, and I think you've recognized a possible point. Thank you. Okay. Uh,
that the child is in school in the morning and goes to take care of him. Is it, you know, in spooning, spooning the, the voucher, is it, uh, none of it will go to uh, the daycare if the child had been in school during the day and is only going to the daycare with the daycare portion of it? Or, you know, I, I don't quite know how this would work. And the second big question I have is, will the school districts also get this uh, this amount? Will they receive this the same full amount if they take four year olds into the program? Thank you. Representative Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative. So the scholarship is designed uh, to, to go to an early learning quality program. That there has been some discussion of possibly breaking this stuff to allow it to flow in, like perhaps a CCAP as well. Because I can see a case where you might have four hours of an early learning program and have childcare uh, later that you might have to break this up. And we've had those discussions. I actually think that's a worthy conversation to have as well, so I'm glad you brought that up. Um, the second part of your question, I, I want to make sure. Oh, the schools. Yeah, I, as I understand it, um, a school can absolutely accept a child through scholarship. And they would be then taking the cost of that child and not the entire scholarship. So if they can do it for a certain rate that's higher or lower, um, we can make those adjustments. Obviously, obviously, if it's higher than the cap, then we have the cap problem. So uh, my understanding, or my, my actually my intention would be, it doesn't matter what they choose. If you choose a school-based program, if you choose a, a, a child care center or a preschool center, that's up to you, and we're just trying to provide the scholarship to make sure you can fund that tuition. Uh, there's costs no matter what, whether it's a school-based program or a child care. It's just can we cover those and give the, the parents flexibility. But thank you. Thank you. Uh, Representative Mullen, or excuse me, actually, Representative Anderson, you're next. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. The question from Ms. Mullen, I'm waiting for Alexandria. She's going to step down again. And, and a concern I think a lot of us have that uh, Arthur Monsky is that these programs and scholarships that are that Croatia is talking about are available statewide. And I would just like to ask if she knows, as you know from Alexandria, uh, to your knowledge, how many folks out in the general area that are already qualified and rated in the parent order system? Any of us, any kind of ballpark number? Mr. Barton, through Madam Chair, from Senator Anderson. I would have to say Erica Moss would be probably a better, she's the, uh, the numbers person, and she's probably uh, looking for those right now. Um, I can tell you in Douglas County, I believe there are four, four star rated providers, uh, family child care providers. Um, and I could not tell you how many three star, um, but I know there are several, you know, going through the process right now. When you start the process, you know, it, it takes it takes time to, you know, put all the training together and, and the paperwork and, and to achieve your rating. Mr. Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm sure you want to look at the number of eyes, but more than quickly, could you describe the process of becoming rated um, in terms of the time commitment that, that it took for you and how to describe the entire process of being rated in, in the parent order system. Ms. Barton. Madam Chair, Representative Anderson, um, I, I've been watching um, and, and knew that the parent order, um, when it was going to be available in my county, so I was um, ahead of the ball game. I knew that I had to get certain trainings, um, and I had actually um, taken, I uh, received my, my CDA um, d um, and so I had taken a lot of the classes previous to um, when, when Parent Aware was going to be available in the county. So it didn't take me quite as long. Uh, the, when I go out and, and um, teach my, my trainings, um, mandatory trainings to family child care providers, um, I, I always talk about Parent Aware and how they should be participating in Parent Aware and how it's a really you know, great program, a chance to better yourself. But more importantly is the fact that a lot of the providers are going to have uh, self-awareness that they're already doing the right things. Um, it was kind of a, a self-awareness that you are on the right step. Uh, but providers um, across the board are, are scared um, sometimes of having somebody come into their home and telling them what to do. Um, or um, sometimes it's just 
it, it kind of depends on where you're coming from, where you're starting, how many different trainings you have to take, and what um, what star you're going to go for. Um, a one star is um, one one hour class over the minimum licensing requirements. So it's very easy to um, attain um, once they decide that they're going to participate. Uh, I found that providers don't necessarily like going for a one star because they're you know they have overachievers and are. They don't think the one star looks very good, so they want to wait before entering on the program until they have more of the training behind them so they can start in at a two or a three star. Um, so providers are, you know, they have very different opinions and processes of how they go about attaining their, their rating. Okay, again, Ms. Voss, have you located the numbers? <laughs> Uh, Madam Chair, Eric Hamas from Parent Aware for School Readiness. Uh, I have, what I have are uh, percentage participation by county for licensed providers. And in Douglas County, um, there is 11% participation currently. Um, that county, I believe, was it 2014? Um, came online with ratings. Ratings became available in 2014 in Douglas County. Uh, if you look at counties that have had a lot of scholarships and where ratings became available in 2012, for example, at Tasca County, 40% um, of uh, licensed providers are participating. Um, Clearwater and Manoman counties, Clearwater 35%, Manoma 25%. So um, what we see in the data is what I was describing earlier. Um, counties come online. It takes a while to build awareness among providers. It takes a while for providers to move through the process. The longer ratings are available um, and the more incentives there are, uh, the more providers participate. Um, in an area, for example, like the um, northeastern part of the state, um, you have some other counties that have, have um, tipped over 30% participation uh, because of local efforts and incentives that are available. Um, but again, the examples I think um, that are especially relevant to the conversation the committee is having today, um, Itasca County, where they have raised to the top scholarships, a, a good number of scholarships, and cap scholarships, a lot of availability in the areas around the White Earth Reservation. Again, White Earth Reservation has some of those raised to the top scholarships, a high number of scholarships, um, uncapped scholarships. You see um, fairly high participation rates of providers and um, you know, it's going well in those areas, and, and um, you know, over time across the state, we expect rates to continue to rise. And um, could you provide that list by county? Really, that would be helpful. Thank you. Uh, all right. Uh, so, Representative Mullery. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, several things on this. Um, first of all. I, I understand where Representative Marquardt is coming from, but I also understand that I partly agree with him and partly don't agree with him because it's not just rural, it's um, there's a lot of communities of color um, that want to go to a certain person that their family is connected to or something, especially more new immigrants, uh, but not just them. And while I understand that maybe the fastest growing uh, numbers of people getting the certification are in communities of color, they're still way down and there's a lot more. Um, so I, I think that maybe tweaking this a little more as you go on might be a good thing. Um, I don't, um, I'm, I'm wondering exactly what did you say? You said you're going to increase the cap from 5,000 by 15 or 20 percent. Is that what you were saying? I, it sounded like that to me. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 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 We were four started. Yeah, we were four started program. We're going to increase um, the percentage of the scholarship for those children uh, by 15, 15 percent if you go to a three-star 
play your center and put four stars. So the encouragement is two things. Try to lift that cap a little bit, but also try to lift those caps for and give them the same programs that get those higher ratings. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, I'm sorry. I, I'm concerned that from what I'm hearing, there's quite a few families that an increase of a thousand dollars even which would be the maximum that you would raise is it's not going to make it um, for a lot of really at risk kids in the inner city so um, I, I hope that okay. you go along maybe you can push that some more um, the reality is is that it's just not going to do enough even when they I know the scholarships can be paired with some other money, but it still isn't going to be enough. Um, one other thing that um, there was reference to um, our rolling. But it, it needs to be pointed out, everybody keeps quoting them. In fact, I just checked with them in the last week, both uh, our Ronick and our Reynolds who did the Chicago Longitudinal Study, I know both of them went. Um, those are the results that people claim from them, 7 to 1 are only near. That only applies to really very at-risk kids and only with more than just the scholarship, it involves um, involvement with parents and different things like that. So um, hopefully you can wrap this together a little more. And then um, I wasn't sure what you mentioned doing something with CCAP, and that's when you're talking about raising money. I, I, I've got bills in to try and did CCAP into reality, which it's not, but you're apparently working with them, so maybe interplay between that. Right now, in many people in my neighborhood, if you're facing eight to ten thousand um, dollars for a decent program, right now, CCAP, unless you're uh, getting the extra fifteen or twenty percent, gives you two thousand. Well, a lot of Parents can't afford the six, seven, eight thousand um, dollars. So I hope you'll work on that and um, let me know how you're going on that. And then, just as a one final question um, of Ms. Milan, I thought she said that between her and two other people, they had a total of 252 years working in childcare. And I was wondering if that was right. <laughs> I am Miss Island, but I think I should not go into this. I don't have some money on this issue for you. No, the purpose of the family, I was referring to the uh, age of three organizations, which includes Phyllis Union Community Center, the Family Partnership, and Way to Grow. Combined, we have. <laughs> 252 years. That's what's terrible. You need families. Thank you. And Thank you. And Representative Thank you. And if I could respond to you, Representative Mullery, uh, let me tell you what my intentions are with it. And you can ask your right about Mr. Rounds and Mr. Rolnick. In fact, I've been talking to Mr. Rolnick as well. And uh, he's going to stay with the meeting, but we haven't been able to actually, so actually have him here. I said we use your name all the time. Let's, let's push you here. But I'll come back to April 15th. But I will be very, very clear with you on who I'm trying to reach. And Representative Moore, you and I have been on the Child Protection Task Force. There are children that when they receive a knock on the door from uh, Child Protection Services are woefully the most disadvantaged. Uh, when they receive that knock on the door, whether it's an allegation or something that's happening, poverty, chronic depression, uh, chronic inebriation that happens in the past, those set those children back immensely. Those are the children I'm trying to reach. And I'll be very clear about that. Well, I also appreciate uh, Representative Mark Wilson and many times, and he's trying to make accommodations with programs. 
But the fact of the matter, when those children are getting a knock on the door, we can also tie a pretty strong causation that they're going to be the ones that we're talking about the achievement gap, they're the ones that we're going to be talking about the juvenile detention centers, they're the ones that we're going to be talking about in the workforce later on. That's the children I'm trying to reach. And I'm very clear about that. And I know what I'm, I'm asking. Um, and I'd like to get to those children first through this program. I'd like to get to them in the cleanest possible way we can. The reality is the resources that we have as a state are limited. And we're going to have tensions among programs. We're going to have tensions among providers who are trying to uh, take care of themselves as a provider or take care of their bottom line. I understand all that. But at the end of the day, when I put my head in the pillow, I want to make sure that those kids are the first and foremost thing that I thought about and the last thing that I thought about when I went to bed. That's what this program is about. And you're right, it's not rural, it's not metro, because you can be neglected, you can be abused, and you can be disadvantaged anywhere in our state. And if our dollars aren't finding you, other programs and other things will. Uh, and sometimes they're not the things that we want. Sometimes they're the gangs, sometimes they're the drugs, sometimes they're the alcohol. And, and many times, it's not the education. We just help them out to find them. That's the intention of my program. Uh, that's the intention of trying to make this a pure pathway one program. That's the intention of trying to drive this directly to those kids, no matter what the formidable obstacles that are in front of us. I realize that we're trying to sometimes expand that sphere and reach other children, and I know that, and let's try to do that. But I'm telling you in this program, let's first drive as straight of an arrow as we can right into the hearts of those disadvantaged communities and try to get them out. Because if we can do that now, if we can do that now, we can start to find other solutions and other ROI. Our role Nick talks about this incessantly. Um, the reason the ROI is so great for these disadvantaged kids is because they have so far to go. They're so far down the bottom. That's why the ROI is so good. I'm talking about bringing the middle up. We're talking about bringing the bottom just to up a quarter percentile. He talks about three things. The program has to focus on adverse children. We have to focus on those kids. And the program has to have a long-term commitment. The reason there's a fade out is because we give them up to about second or third grade, and then we say, no, we did a great job, and we let them go. We can't. And the third thing we have to do is we have to try to get some type of parental uh, involvement. We have to get those parents in to care, and they have to be part of that transportation. They have to be part of that commitment. They have to go sit down sometimes and read the Dr. Seuss book over and over and over and over and say, you're ad nauseum with those words. Like, I have done my kids, and we have all done but it's the simple things. And that's what I'm trying to do with this program. I'm not trying to leave anybody out, but I'm certainly trying to focus it so that we can hit some of these kids that really need it the most. So thank you, Representative Mulvey. We spent a lot of time on committee, and I, you know, I, I just can't stress enough when that knock on the door arrives because somebody has an allegation on a kid, how much that affects that kid's life. Thank you. Um, so, Peppers, we're going to go to testifiers um, next and we'll come back. I've got a couple of you on the list for questions, but I want to make sure we can hear from testifiers before we run out of time today. So whoever wants to go first. Madam Chair and members of the committee, my name is Jane Payton and I'm the Head Start Director of Three Rivers Community Action. And I'm here today to testify to oppose any bill that would eliminate um, Pathway 2 scholarship funding. But more importantly, I'm here on behalf of the children and families that actually choose Head Start. Head Start is a choice by families, and by choosing Head Start, they are actually choosing a four-star parent award program, and are also choosing a program that has Pathway 2 um, scholarship funding. So, the main point I want to make about the scholarship Pathway 2 is that it's very innovative and very flexible. Um, we can, we know our families and we know how to design the programs to tailor to what our family needs. So if I know a family, um, families will benefit more, more from home visiting because I'm in, I come from a more rural counties, then we can take the pathway to funds and we can create a home visiting program. Or maybe our families need more center-based care. Well, then I can take the pathway funds and I can create a more center-based program. Maybe they have transportation issues. I can um, provide busing for them. This is all because the funds come directly to my program, not just the individual family. So I can really tailor, tailor these um, programs to what I need. Um, my pathway funding is going to look different than Kappa W in St. Paul, or back in Minneapolis. Different kids, different families, different areas. 
But that one one is just giving it to that single family. So there's that innovation that we can have with that one too. Um, also, as long as I have been an district director, I have not had one single family come to me with a Pathway 1 scholarship. Not one. So I, I, don't, I don't know where they are. Um, the thing is, with when I create programming with Pathway 2, I go out and I recruit families. And I say, look, we have this great um, program we're doing. Do you want to apply? Then they apply. It's still a choice of whether they want to apply or not. But I'm going out and I'm finding those kids that are most in need. I'm not waiting for them to come to me. I just really would really reconsider eliminating pathway to just because of the innovation that it allows. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Welcome. Good afternoon. My name is Heidi Webster. Um, Madam Chair, representatives on this committee. Um, I Thank you for the opportunity to talk about House Bill 1220. Um, I am the Director of Community Education um, and St. Anthony Wright School District, the smallest geographic school district here in, um, in the state. Um, we are a 2.6 mile school district located between Minneapolis, uh, New Brighton, Columbia Heights, and Roseville. And I would like to, uh, to talk on behalf of the Minnesota Community Education Association, and also I create four-year-old learners, not only in, in San Diego Brighton School District, um, but throughout our state. And one of the things that um, to respond to Representative Krisha's um, testimony as well, uh, I'm also a parent of two adopted sons. We adopted our sons who were in a room from their family at the ages of three and a half and five years of age. They were placed with a foster family. They were placed with my husband and I the age of five and six. Um, I understand trauma. I'm living it. I'm parenting two children who were raised in trauma. Um, and I'm also proud to say they're Head Start graduates. Their Head Start program in uh, Detroit Lakes was a life-saving measure for them, I believe. So one of the things I want to, before I jump to his vet 2020, I want to respond to from Mr. Kusha's suggestion about the, the fund transfers be, between school readiness and ECFB. Specifically, I want to help identify um, and explain the differences between school readiness funding and ECFB funding. And I can give you some examples from our small district in St. Anthony. We received $14,000 in school readiness aid in St. Anthony. And we also received some ECFB funding, a combination of state aid and local levy, which totals about $40,000. Uh, ECFB, the, the First and foremost, focus on ECB is parent education. We believe in ECB that our role is to help parents see that they are a child's first and most important teacher. And so we are able to help parents develop the skills um, because unfortunately our kids don't come with rule books. They don't come with a playbook. And so we help parents develop the skills necessary to raise children in, in our world today. In St. Anthony, one of the innovative things we've chosen to do with our ECB funding is our ECB teachers go out to our partner communities. We have partnerships with our local partner communities. What we know is that a high portion of our families of color live in our partner communities in St. Anthony. What we also know is that we were not seeing those families in our ECB classes on site, so we bought this the program to them. So once a week, we provide free on site ECB programs. What that allows us to do, it allows us to create relationships with families on site in their communities. And through those relationships, um, we're able to help meet the needs of those families and then talk about what the next step is in that parenting journey, in their child's educational journey. We're able to meet families when children are, are zero, one, and two and talk about what, what preschool will look like. One of the things we're also proud about, we just celebrated 40 years here in Minnesota. So, and it's unique to Minnesota. No other state has ECB, only Minnesota. So I want to um, well, thank you to your commitment to early learning and ECB. The last legislative session, as you know, we, we have more work to do. But one of the things that um, I'm very proud of throughout the state, having two scholarships have allowed increased participation in high-quality, four-star, school-based early childhood programs. However, a singular pathway one scholarship track is not an efficient or an effective way to provide access to high-quality school-based early childhood programs. Elimination of pathway two scholarships without significant increases to school readiness funding would greatly impact and reduce the number of families who have access to high-quality 
for start school based early childhood programs, for start and start programs. Parents are choosing school based programs and qualifying for pathway to scholarships. Pathway to scholarships allow school districts the flexibility to meet various needs of families in their communities. School districts are currently planning for their 15 16 early childhood programs. We're submitting proposed budgets to school boards, and tomorrow our pathway to applications are due to the Minnesota Department of Education detailing how exactly we will spend those dollars and how they will be tied to a specific student. Pathway to scholarships also allow school districts the flexibility to expand or enhance early childhood programs based on the needs of our families. One of the same both of expansion and enhancement is increasing the percentage of children who have high needs in programs and increasing the number of staff in the classroom to support the children. And I absolutely agree that the children that Representative Prishan talked about are the children that we have developed relationships with families and we want in our programs, but we also know that uh, children that come from high risk situations often need more support in the classroom. Pathway two dollars allow us to provide that additional support to help those children be successful. Uh, for example, St. Anthony, we have a child who probably for and receives a Pathway to scholarship whose parents came to our program in the fall and reported he'd been kicked out of two other early childhood programs. The children's parents are both immigrants. He's learning both of their home languages at home and at school. He has uh, twin siblings that were born prematurely, so his mother was at the hospital for a couple months um, and out of his life. So with Pathway 2 scholarship dollars, we are able to hire a staff member to directly assist this child with transitions in the classroom. He remains in our program and is experiencing success in our early childhood classroom. A second example of program enhancement is to stabilize a family's ability to pay tuition in order to support consistent attendance. We also have another child in St. Anthony who qualified for and receives a pathway to scholarship whose parents came to our program in the fall. The father has been caring for his daughter and he's living with ALS. Um, the deterioration of his health does not allow him to care for his child while um, the mother, his wife, works full time. They need a full-time early child program for their daughter. They apply for a pathway one scholarship. They're on the child care waiting list, um, and they have limited income to pay for a program. With the pathway two scholarship dollars, I could sit down. We could walk through the application. Um, we are able to use that funding to meet their needs as a family and enroll their daughter in a full-day program. For my colleagues in the Wilmer School District, pathway two scholarships have been a great asset for families. Family liaisons work with eligible families to help them choose a quality school-based program that meets their needs. They provide transportation and work with family schedules. Without the assistance of Wilmer's family liaisons, I do not believe any of the families served would be able to navigate the barriers to accessing a pathway one scholarship. Even more, families would not be able to afford programming without scholarship assistance that pathway two resources provide. As I said, the elimination of Pathway 2 scholarships without significant increases to school readiness funding would reduce the number of families who have access to high quality four star school based early childhood programs. Thank you for your time and to your commitment to our youngest learners in Minnesota. Thank you. Um, all right, so I've got a list and uh, now additional uh, questions. So, uh, first of all, yes, are there any other providers or folks in the early childhood community who still want to testify before we resume questions? All right, so uh, Representative Seltzer, thank you for your patience. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Representative Patient, for bringing this forward. And it is wonderful to be here and have all my colleagues here. And this was a dream for many years, as back when I was a parent advocate, we were advocating for funding for um, our, our early, uh, our youngest learners, so this is a, a great thing. Um, you know, the testifier uh, from St. Anthony did uh, such a great job that I kind of had a list of points I was going to make, but I will not repeat them. But I do just want to reiterate her point, Representative Krisha, and that is that we need to have a big enough tent for all of these fabulous um, ways that we can assist our youngest learners at risk. And that includes, you know, the Miss Bartons of the world. She obviously does a great job. You know, the Head Start Testifier is amazing. And our school districts, too, many of them have waiting lists. And you did ask for input. You know, I'm a suburban legislator, and I can tell you that um, at least two out of the three school districts I represent um, are starting, or have not starting, they have programs for uh, students at risk. I know one uh, school district is just simply funding that out of its fund balance because it's tired of waiting for the state to catch up. 
and it provides wraparound services that um, Dr. Stefan and Steve Anthony talked about. You've got the nurse, the school nurse there. You've got the the principal. You've got administrators, other professionals to reach out and make sure that those needy kids are receiving those services and their families are receiving the services they need to get on the path to success. So. I've voted for um, uh, the Early Learning Scholarships. You know, in the last legislative session was how to do it. But this is not the time. We need all hands on deck. So this is not the time to structure the system of presented creation. So we're excluding some of these wonderful forms of early childhood education. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, 
there's also some, some issues here that are around efficiency. Uh, a one, uh, one page application that doubles as the application for frame reduced lunch is a whole lot simpler than a five page application for a pathway to scholarship that may not be available in the language that you commonly read right. Um, so I think we need to offer an intent about meeting the needs of these kids, and I, I have no question, no question that you, that is your intent. I think if we want the maximum return on investment, and if we want to support the most efficient programming, which we now benefit from because it makes the dollar go a little bit further, eliminating the pathway to just doesn't get us there. Um, and in fact, I know, you know, I've, I've heard this and, and the advocates don't like hearing it, but there's 600 families in Minneapolis who've chosen the Minneapolis public schools for the child aid program. It's a program that is disproportionately compared to the rest of the district, compared to the rest of the district, disproportionately low income, disproportionately uh, immigrant. And the results are disproportionately ready for kindergarten compared to any of their peers. And yet there's 600 kids still sitting on a waiting list. Families who have chosen that program. So if you talk about program of choice, don't choose this program because the right results are outstanding. And they're not going to get cut off. I don't think that responds either to parental choice or to return on investment. Um, I would urge you to you know, look again at continuing the pathway to program and make it, you know, for the application process, more like St. Anthony, where it's a one-page application, not a five-page. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. If this uh, partner or Ms. Malone, could you explain the process for getting into your program through Pathway 1? What's it like for a family? We have a director for our early child development program and assistant director. When families come into the center, they, we meet with them, they have a tour of our early child development classrooms. Our application, I believe, is about six pages. Um, but it, it's extensive. Uh, not only are we getting information about the family, social, economic, and also getting information about the child, learning about the child's interest, um, experiences that the child and family has had so that we can customize and focus on that child doing well and meeting the five domains of early child development. Has that been daunting to those families going through the path of one? Yes, you know, again, I think our director needs to be here because she can specifically answer that. Um, I think our families are one just grateful that the state of Minnesota is supporting early child development. And perhaps the application might be wrong, but I think our families, uh, again, just appreciate that they're getting some type of assistance because the cost of early child development um, it's high, and we need to have that support for our children and our families. And thank you for that. And thank you. So, you mentioned about a parent's and daddy. You actually read the process, gave me nothing. But it's the Department of Education that set the pathway to the process up. If they want to make this easier, and I would work with them, because they're the ones that are ultimately responsible, they set the process up. If you remember back to last session when we were trying to do this, um, they claimed it. Not, not the scholarship, not the pathway two versus the pathway one. The Department of Education clouded this process. I would invite them to work on us to clean this up, and we can do that. Um, I don't believe it's necessarily the, the vehicles. I mean, I don't believe the challenges we have here is pathway one versus pathway two. It, it's the lack of resources, and I absolutely recognize that. And I'm on the Head Start bill. Uh, it, I have a proposed language to talk about early uh, learning and school readiness dollars. We have to bring the water up for all of this. And you're absolutely right. You, uh, you know, you have families that have chosen the Minneapolis and they've chosen 
and we don't have room for them, and we don't have the funds for them yet. I would love to try to get there, and I'm trying to. I, I can only chisel away at the ice so much, but eventually when I chisel away enough, my sculpture will look pretty good, and I hope you'll join me in enjoying that. Representative Murphy, and I'm going to let you ask the last questions for today. Um, we will, you know, go until 12 at 2.30, and I apologize, Representative Grishy, you've got one other bill on the calendar, which we won't get to until tomorrow, and Representative Christensen, you're in the same pool. So, um, but good discussion today, so I appreciate that. Representative Murphy. I Chair, Ms. Webster, you struck with some of your comments just struck me like, the public to um, the students are in small classrooms, aren't they? Twenty kids or less than twenty kids. So, sir, that's correct. And your part, in your remarks, you talked about children being kicked out of their school and coming to you. That's correct. That's correct. They said, they said you can understand. That's correct. And the, it's early childhood. Yes. Can you, can you describe the one or two situations these little children being out of, out of your school and coming to you? Absolutely, the, the child that I was referring to, and I'm sure Ms. Bacon has stories as well, Arkansas with children um, start our, our early childhood programs, our preschool programs at age three. Oftentimes, um, it's their first uh, opportunity and a, a group experience. Um, they've had um, Limited previous experiences, uh, and oftentimes because of uh, trauma in their uh, previous life experience, it is very difficult for them uh, physiologically. They're a three year old, um, emotionally, um, developmentally, and maybe on a one or two year old. So sometimes behaviors you see, um, you see uh, biting, pushing, because they're learning to use their words in the classroom. And we understand that as typical developing process of children. Um, unfortunately for this family, their experience, um, and it was an immigrant family uh, who was uh, struggling with their child, um, they were embarrassed by the behaviors, and we were very confident with them in that we can help your child, he will be successful in our program, uh, and we've been able to provide um, some support for him, and, and he's transitioned our program and has done quite well. Depending on the site, I think um, some early childhood programs are are more tolerant of, of a variety of behaviors um, and know that um, and are confident that they can help that child develop the skills they need uh, to transition to a program. Um, unfortunately, I think it's more common than, than we wish to admit. Um, I know that we've, we've certainly encountered a number of families under my seventh year um, in San Anthony. We've encountered probably a couple dozen families that have came to us um, because they've been kicked out of other early childhood programs. And I'm sure Ms. Webster, one more question on those forms that the parents have all been for their child in the program. Do you ask the question that have been kicked out of a previous experience? Ms. Webster. Obviously, the difference between pathway one and pathway two, but it sounds like 
from some of the testimony that, that, that you all help parents with the applications regardless of halfway one or halfway two. Is that correct? Or, um, no, Ms. Um, it, it sounded like um, you go out and seek parents or families that may uh, need the services of the, the Head Start program that you operate uh, from halfway two, but not necessarily from halfway one. Is there a particular reason why? Is it just that you know you have the dollars? to accommodate them with the pathway to, or, um, and I don't want to go into your house, so what did you tell me? Thank you. Uh, yes, depending on how you use the fellowship to fund the new development program. So, I use them to extend my time. So, I run a summer program. So, what we do is we go out and recruit families in our summer program that would qualify for pathway to. I've never had a pathway one family come to me. I mean, they must fill it out, and then they must get on. They must get to a scholarship. But I'm not sure they know what to do with it or where to find these four star major programs. Head Start automatically is so we automatically if we apply for the um, scholarship two grant, we get that, and then like I said, we can choose how we want to use that. Whether it's um, hiring more teachers to make a small class size, extending it into a summer program. Maybe I can't afford transportation. Now I can afford transportation, and I can actually bus more teachers in the program. But really, really a lot of flexibility. And I think the right here are definitely reaching more kids like that. And so the, the students, if you expanded for a summer program, would that be for students currently in your in, in your program, maybe during the school year, then, then you're allowing them to have the opportunity to have your services in the summer as well? Okay. Thank you. And either of the other two of you want to comment on that? We, we don't um, have staff capacity to go out and enroll parents, but we haven't had a problem with parents coming in to enroll their children. If we had more capacity, we could enroll more children than we currently have. Thank you. All right. Uh, Representative Chris, any final comments? Very briefly. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just all I want to say to my fellow upstairs in the room is uh, we're the most lobbying for these kids. Uh, that's all they have. And so I thank you for the discussion. I thank you for everything you've offered and I hope it will be. All right. And so with that, uh, Representative Grace Green News this motion that House uh, Bill 1220 be referred to as means, but I'm laying it over for today. And uh, thank you to the committee for their uh, questions and their participation today. We are adjourned.